and go into something else. But there's a lot of good, encouraging things that we find in the Psalms. If you ever go through a time of discouragement, uh, the Psalms are just a great place to be reading. Uh, Psalms and Proverbs, of course, you read five Psalms a day, you can get through the Psalms in a month. You read one proverb a day, you can get through them uh, that is in that book in a, a month as well. But uh, here in Psalm 11, just a real short psalm, but it deals with something. David here is dealing with an issue that we all deal with. Is whenever we are uh, confronted with a problem or a difficulty of some sort, the temptation for us is so often oftentimes is to turn and run away from the problem. And that's not always God's plan. Now, there's times when it's okay, you just get out of Dodge, get there and go. Uh, but I know that there has been uh, pastors that I've known in the ministry, uh, they have uh, gone through a difficult time in their church, and they just up and leave. Uh, not always a good thing. Sometimes God wants that. He'll use that to move you on. But sometimes he expects you to stick it out and to confront uh, the problems or issues at hand. And it's the same true for all of us. And here in Psalm 11, I've simply been titled this message, Why Not Run Away and Hide? Because sometimes that's what we feel like doing. And let's read the psalm here and then we'll get into uh, the actual teaching part here of the psalm. It says, In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain. For lo, the wicked bend their bow, they make ready their arrow upon the string, that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in the heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence his soul hated. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire, and brimstone, and in horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. For the righteous Lord, for the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance doth behold the upright. And this is a kind of an easy psalm to break down here. And so we're going to do that here in a minute. But let's pray as we get into the message. Our Father, we thank you. That you love us. We thank you, Lord, that when we go through times of trials and difficulties, that, Lord, you're always there. Uh, you go through these things with us. And, Father, I pray that you will uh, just remove me out of the way, Lord, so that you can speak through me. I pray that you cleanse me of sin so I can be a vessel fit for your use. And, Lord, I pray that you will anoint our ears that we can hear from you tonight. Lord, I don't know what all the needs are represented by the folks in this room, but I know that you know the needs. You know what my needs are. You know each individual. You know all the prayer requests that were mentioned earlier. And uh, Lord, sometimes uh, we get overwhelmed by the things that happen to us in life. But Lord, I'm glad that nothing is too heavy for you. Nothing is too hard. Uh, Lord, you're able to take care. And it's all very easy for you. And your yoke is easy, you say, and your burden is light. So Lord, we just need to cast our care upon you. And I pray that you might use this psalm to just encourage our heart, to help direct our thinking. Uh, when we go through times of difficulty, when we go through, uh, we're faced with challenges. And sometimes, Lord, it's not just difficulty. Sometimes it's just a challenge we're faced with, uh, something that would be seemingly difficult. Uh, but, Lord, you're able to help us with those things as well. Mm-hmm. And so, Father, I pray that you will bless now as only you can. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Well, you know, I think often as David was writing this, it's been debated as far as what he had in mind when he was writing it. Some people think he wrote it early on uh, in his life, maybe soon after he faced Goliath. Uh, That would be a possibility. Some people think it was uh, maybe when he faced some other trials later on in his life. Uh, But none of that really matters. We can take the situation when he faced Goliath, and you know, we all have... Goliaths that we face from time to time. There are giants that we face, and things that seem insurmountable to us. But you know, we need to rem- remember the battle is is the Lord's. It's not ours. The battle belongs to the Lord. And David, whenever he was faced with Goliath, and uh, 
I always remember this in the story. I love this part about the story of David and Goliath when he grabbed the smot, the five smooth stones there. We actually, when we went to D.C., we got to see the size of the stones they would use uh, in those slings. And they were about that big. They're pretty good sized stones. I mean, I always thought of like a little rock or something, a smooth stone. And I thought, yeah, well, that, I guess God can make it kill some. But you get hit some bad boy like that, and the slings are nice and long. So you've got something flying at you really, really fast and hits you right smack in the forehead, which is what happened to Goliath. Uh, now, normally, you would fall down backwards. But, of course, we know Goliath fell face first. And I believe oftentimes what happened, and we don't know this, the Bible doesn't say it, but I just picture God's hand on the back of Goliath's neck, and he just directing that stone. Boom! <laughs> Throws him down. But I like what ha- what the Bible says about David when they were kind of trash-talking each other. And, uh, of course, Goliath's cursing David's God and the Israelites' God. And David, he starts giving it back to him. And then the Bible says that David hasted towards the enemy. He hasted towards his Goliath. And what do we tend to do? We tend to run away and hide, don't we? We have to be careful and make sure that we're always walking in uh, the spirit of the Lord. Now, apparently, David was encouraged to run from his troubles. If you look here uh, in verse 1, it says, And the Lord put out my trust. How say ye to my soul? Somebody here is encouraging David to run and just get out of Dodge. Run and get away from his problems. He says, How say ye to my soul? Flee as a bird to your mountain. He said, look, why don't you just leave? It's kind of like Job's wife when she said, why don't you just curse God and die? There's always people like that in our life that will encourage us in this way, but it's not really, that's not the type of encouragement that we need. In the country, David was to face uh, a lion and a bear. He learned how to worship God during that time and how to love God. In the court, David was faced with a king that wanted to kill him. There he learned wisdom and how to limit himself. In the cave, after David had fled from Saul, David learned warfare. And in the process of learning warfare, he learned how to lead men. You see, God has a plan and purpose for every trial we face. Whether uh, it's David in the country facing a lion and a bear, whether it's when he's in uh, the court of Saul and the king himself is ready to kill him, David learns how to handle himself wisely. Matter of fact, the Bible says in 1 Samuel 18, uh, several places. Go ahead, hold your place here for a second. Let's just turn back there uh, and look at what it says here of David and how he learned these things. 1 Samuel chapter 18 and verse number 5 is the first place. This is where he's in the court of Saul, and Saul is seeking to kill him. Verse 5 says, And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him, and behaved himself, what? Wisely. You see, David was learning some things in his trials. He behaved himself wisely, and Saul sent him over the men of the war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Now look at verse 14, if you would, of the same chapter. It says, And David behaved himself wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. You see, David had to learn how to behave himself wisely. He had to learn how to have some self-control. And uh, sometimes it's even, he had to learn to deny himself and put God's will ahead of his own. But look now, if you would, down in verse uh, 30. I'm sorry, verse 15, I meant to read verse 15 as well, then we'll look at verse 30. Wherefore, when Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid of him. So we see back in verse 5, he behaved himself wisely. Verse 14 and 15, now he behaves himself very wisely. Now look at verse 30, if you would. Actually, let's read verse 29. And Saul was yet the more afraid of David, and Saul became David's enemy continually. Then the princes of the Philistines went forth, and it came to pass, after they went forth, that David behaved himself more wisely 
than all the servants of Saul, so that his name was much set by. You see, David's faced with a lot of trials and difficulties, but God is using that to teach David a lot of things. Remember in the country, he learned how to worship and how to love God. In the court, he learned wisdom and how to live himself. In the cave, he learned warfare and how to lead men. Now back in Psalm 11, let's look here at this psalm with this idea in mind as David is being encouraged to just run away from his problems and hide. And he's like, no, no, no. I'm not going to run away. There's something God is doing here in the midst of this, this trial that I'm faced with. First of all, what we see here in verses 1 through 3 is we see fear is conquered. Verse 2 says, For lo, the wicked bend their bow, and they make ready their arrow upon the string, that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? So David chooses to stay with his protector. And who was his protector? God Almighty. You know, when we, it's like you think of Goliath. David's facing his Goliath. Where was God in all that? He was right there in the battle. The battle is the Lord's. Had he run from the battle, he would have been running from his protector. David chose to stay with his protector. God so oftentimes is waiting at the battle. So what we should do is we should run to him instead of from him. In verse 2 here, we see that the wicked, the enemy, they are trying to shoot at the upright in heart. And the, the word there, privily, it says privily shoot at the upright heart. That means they're trying to hit, hit them from ambush. They're coming at them from all sides, you know, uh, unsuspectingly. In Ephesians 6.16, it tells us this. It talks about the armor of God. It says, above all, taking uh, the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. The wicked is trying to hit us from ambush. He's going to hit you when you least expect it. He's, he's firing all these darts at you. And what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to take the shield of faith. And it quenches all the fiery darts of the wicked. It puts them out. Makes them useless. But look at verse 3. In verse 3 we see something interesting here. It says, if the foundations be destroyed. Now what it's doing here, it's giving a hypothetical situation. In this hypothetical situation that we ought to consider is if every earthly thing that we have to look to, if it all fails and lets us down, what do the righteous do? If everything fails, what can the righteous do? If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Well, let me give you some things here the righteous can do. This is kind of where David's mindset was. We know this from looking at other psalms. We can suffer joyfully. Isn't that what the Bible tells us that we ought to do? Because this might be God's will for us. So we can still suffer joyfully. We can hope cheerfully. We can keep looking to the Lord. We can wait patiently. Wait patiently on the Lord. We can pray earnestly. When the foundations are being destroyed, when it seems like all the things on the earth are failing, we can pray earnestly. The effectual, fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. We can believe confidently. God's got it under control. God's not caught off guard. He's not caught by surprise. And then finally, we can triumph in the end. We can triumph finally. So this is kind of what this hypothetical situation we see here in verse 3. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Well, there's some things the righteous can do. There are some things the righteous ought to do. We ought to look at things that way. Now, as we think about fear being conquered, let's look here at verses 4 through 6. This is where there are some facts that's given here in verses 4 through 6 that we ought to consider. First of all, it says here in verse 4, The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. Now, the first thing we ought to consider is where the Lord sits. Where the Lord sits. His throne is in the heaven. The Bible says the earth is his footstool. You think about how massive God would have to be. How powerful God is to speak this world into existence. 
God is sitting on his throne, and often it may seem as if when we go through trials or we're faced with a Goliath or we're faced with a lion and a bear or we're faced with uh, a king that wants to kill us, we're faced with these things, oftentimes it might seem like there's a God that's silent. And evil men and seducers, they just keep waxing worse and worse, don't they? And we're like, Lord, what's going on? Why is this happening? Why are these things taking place? In the 17th and 18th centuries, Christianity's influence seemed so weak that many people thought at that time that the Lord had to return in the 17th and 18th centuries. If you remember some of the things that went on during that time, you had uh, what was known as the Enlightenment, the Age of Reason. Uh, that was during the same time period when a lot of... Uh, just ungodly men started putting forth a lot of just wicked philosophies, denying God and everything about God. And it seemed that Christianity's influence just became so weak, the Lord had to come back soon. And what they were thinking at that time is that God was allowing the world to go to ruin. However, in the 19th century, there were four great revivals. That swept across different parts of the world. You see, these revivals, God, when he's faced with some what we look like as a difficulty, God handles these things completely different than what we do. Yeah. We think, oh, all hope is lost. What's going to happen now? God says, okay, now it's time to get to work. Here's an opportunity. You see, we see things so differently than what God does. The Bible tells us his ways are much higher than our ways. His thoughts are much higher than our thoughts. So the Lord is still sitting on his throne. Christ is still king. Who knows what's going to happen with this election coming up. But you know what? Our hope isn't in a politician anyway. Our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. As a Christian, we ought to do and fulfill our responsibility as an American citizen. Now, what's sad, I think I shared this with you Sunday, uh, 41 million evangelicals will probably not vote in this election. And you know what? That's why we get what we deserve. Because when the Christian remains silent, and that is our vote is one way that we can speak up, when a Christian, and these people may not be saved, they may just say they love the Lord and they really don't. I don't know. But when a Christian remains silent, it's no wonder we get what's coming to us. You see, we have a responsibility. But the Lord is still on his throne. But we see here in verse 4 of this psalm, we see the Lord also sees some things. He's sitting on his throne, but now he's also seeing some things here. It says, his eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. Now, that little phrase there, his eyelids try the children of men, I was trying to find out exactly what that meant. And the best that I could come up with, the best I could find, was kind of like when you, you see something and you're trying to, Get a good glimpse now, now, because I'm past the age of 40, it's like I'm holding everything back here. But you know, when I want to see something very close, I get some really good reading glasses. And now I'm like getting down and I'm like focused in. And it's, my eyes are more squinting because I'm trying to focus in on something. <clears throat> That's what they think this means is when his eyelids try to turn him in. He is looking within great detail of what's going on. God's not just looking at things in general. He pays attention to every single detail. And he trieth the children of men, the Bible says. Look at verse 5. The Lord trieth, it says the Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that love the Bible is so hated. It tells us in verse, the end of verse 4, it says, His eyes try the children of men. That children of men is talking about the wicked. It's talking about the worldly. But in verse 5, we see the Lord also tries the righteous. This is his people. You know, God sees every single detail. God allows all of us. He allows unsaved people and he allows saved people to all go through trials so that what's really in here gets exposed. You see, if you're, if you're a Christian, hopefully what gets exposed is that goal will start to come to the top. Or it might be dross and just filth and nastiness that comes to the top. But you know, one way or another, God sees what's really there, and he's going to expose it. 
So we need to understand that. We need to stop and consider that. But we also need to stop and consider that the Lord sends some things. Look at verse 6. It says, Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fires, and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. I love God's sense of humor. God has a great sense of humor. Look at that again, how it says that. It says, Upon the wicked. Now, we all would like to see justice serve, I think. We want to know justice is going to be served. And he says here, upon the wicked, he shall rain snares. That means they're going to get caught in their own trap, their own devices. Everything that they're accusing other people of, everything they're trying to do underhandedly, they're going to fall prey to it themselves. But then it says, he's going to rain fire and brimstone upon them. Now you think about how bad that would be. Fire and brimstone coming down upon them. And then it's kind of like it's an afterthought. Oh, yeah, also, there's going to be a tempest. <laughs> like the fire and brimstone was not enough. It's like he's going to make sure that wickedness is going to be taken care of. Now, we may not always see things in our lifetime. We may not see things the way we would like to see them. But you can rest assured nobody is going to get by with their wickedness. That's what we need to realize the Lord is seeing. And then also, he's going to send judgment. But look at what he's going to send to his people, to the righteous. It says here that uh, in verse 6, Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire, and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness, his countenance doth behold the upright. So what's going to happen to, uh, what is God going to send to the righteous? Well, we know from other portions of Scripture, he's going to send blessings. He wants our cup to run over. He's going to, he wants us to have joy. Uh, he wants us to have peace that passes all understanding. He's just going to keep blessing us and blessing us and blessing us if we are the righteous. You see, those are some facts that we ought to consider. And then as we finish here in verse 7, I just read it there. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. This is where faith is confessed. It says, His countenance doth behold the upright. Now, there's a couple ways we can look at that last phrase there. His countenance doth behold the upright. It, some people think it means God's countenance is beholding the upright. But really, the way, I guess in the Hebrew, the way that is understood is that the righteous is actually beholding the countenance of the Almighty. Why? Because, and this goes along really with the rest of Scripture, because what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to look at the waves and the tempest and the storm and the circumstances of life all around us? Is that what we're supposed to be looking at? Or are we supposed to be looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith? You see, that's what the righteous are going to do. This is where we can confess our faith. When we're going through all kinds of things in life, and it might be uh, just a Goliath. It might be some difficulty that we're faced with. It might be a lion and a bear. It might be somebody's out to do us harm or, or maybe to ruin our testimony or whatever it is. We just need to realize God takes care of all these things. We keep looking into Jesus. We keep confessing his name before the people. And God will take care of all those other circumstances around us. One last place I'd like you to turn. Turn with me to Hebrews 2. And this is where we'll close. Hebrews 2. And look at verse 6 if you would. Thinking about the upright beholding the face of the Lord. This is where our faith can shine forth. In anything in life. Look at verse 6 if you would. Hebrews 2 verse 6. It says, But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all subjection under uh, he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now, we see not yet all things put under him. But look at verse, but we see Jesus. 
Right now, it doesn't look like everything is in control. It doesn't. Look, it looks like things are just running chaotically, doesn't it? But we see Jesus. We see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. You see, that's where we are to be looking unto Jesus, the author and the finish of our faith. The world might be in chaos. I mean, we see things all over the place happening. We know the Lord is ready to return. We can see it. We know what's happening. Don't be caught off guard. But the thing is, don't get your eyes on all that stuff either. You keep looking to the Lord. Keep looking to Him by faith. And that's how. That's one way our faith can be confessed. And as your eyes are looking to Him, your walk, as you're walking in the Spirit, You'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You'll not be giving in to the other things that uh, not just the flesh is wanting to do, turn around and run and hide, but what others may be encouraging to do. Oh, just you know, leave it alone. You know, why are you trying to stand up? You might lose your job. You might have this happen to you. You might have that happen. You might suffer for going right. But when you keep your eyes fixed upon the Lord in every situation, God will take care of those things. God will he'll make it all work out in the end. And we just need to see Jesus, looking to him by faith. That's what David did. David was faced with a lot of trials, a lot of battles. And through those trials and battles, he learned a lot of lessons. He learned how to lead men. He learned God taught his hands how to fight. He learned how to die to himself. He learned a lot of things. Through all those different situations that he faced. And God's trying to teach us some of those same things. Let's all stand. We'll have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your blessings. And Lord, I pray that you help us. As we saw there in the scriptures there at the very last. That, Lord, that even though all things might seem chaotic right now, we just need to see Jesus. We need to keep looking to him. Keep our eyes fixed upon him. Because Lord, you see everything. You're still on the throne. You're still in control. Everything is going to take take care of it. It's going to be taken care of in the end. And Lord, every wicked work is going to be brought into judgment. And your people, Lord, as we live in righteousness, as we follow the word of God, and we just simply obey you, we will be blessed beyond measure. Not just when we get to heaven, but Lord, we can be blessed right here and right now. Father, we thank you for these things. We thank you for David under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, putting these things down and writing so that we can be encouraged thousands of years later that we can take heart in these things as well because you change not and you are no respecter of persons. What you did for David, you also will do for us. And Father, we thank you for these things. But Lord, I pray there be one here that's struggling with their salvation. Lord, I pray that tonight they might get it settled once and for all, that they might... Just do what the Word of God says. They put their faith and trust in you and accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. Lord, for a Christian who maybe is faced with a Goliath, or maybe they're faced with a lion and a bear, or maybe there's a, a Saul that's trying to kill them, or whatever it is, Lord, whatever trial they might be faced with, Lord, help them just to see Jesus and realize that you're on the throne. Father, we pray these things and ask you to bless this song of invitation time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. 204. 204. We're going to sing a few verses. God spoke to you once.